Uh, I don't know if my, I am. Yes, I make noise. It's not really, it's just a genetic thing, I think. I just make noises. I mean, yeah, what, what, what Tracy didn't mention is that my, my elongated title is actually um, named after Sermon Fairchild, who you may know better as the inventor of the Fairchild Channel F. So I, <laughs> right, so that's kind of a, it's a kind of a tall order to live up to. So I hope I will live up to it today. I'm a little echoey. Ah, sorry, that's not probably helpful. <laughs> Making the noises that I want to do. So today, I, have, I guess I'm a little flying off the edges, but that's okay. That's not, um, it's not unlike me. Can we, can we? Muck, muck. Okay. Rich is doing all kinds of things secretly. Okay, so that's great. So I'm so resonant. Um, I'm <laughs> I am so resonant and I am thrilled to be Zoomed. Um, and excited to really wrap up this keynote here today and thinking about all the kinds of things that we've been doing, we've been playing, we've been listening to all the, and this is a sequence of keynotes. And today I want to discuss the history of computer gaming and the clandestine birth of computer science um, with this peaceful play that Bernie has brought in some ways, or at least soft war that we could talk about with the new games movement that, that really lets us get in touch with our essential humanness and that night games kind of brings that about as well. And so what I'm particularly interested in, in is, is, the, is the trajectory of optimism and kind of radical thought that, that is, uh, can be traced through the history of computing and the development of computer games. So that's what I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. So we've, all of you, I, I just want to say I'm really honored to talk to everyone here because we're all innovators and we're all part of this history now. And that makes me really excited to, to craft this framework as innovators and artists that we as a group want to understand what these things that we're making are, you know, and there's a, there's a I don't know if any of us could really say we really get it, you know, and that's the magical aspect of what we do and it's also why we continue to play. So, uh, so, so I'm interested in how these things have these human elements and, and, and how the technology comes into play with the social. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about uh, a few people during the course of my talk and I don't mean to know that that's the only history there is. It's a thread through a history, and it's a little bit of a reworking if you're a computer science historian or something, uh, a little bit. But I, I want to I kind of brand this as our history, as independent game makers and as, as, as artists. So um, I'm going to tell you this tale um, from AAA titles to, uh, to the misty origins of role-playing games and war games. And then I'm going to talk about seven figures who have really shaped and contributed to the ideas of indie games that we know as we know them. All right, so um, I started thinking about this talk and thinking about war, of course, because I always go to war. Some of our oldest games really use war as a metaphor and as a, as a, as a, a kind of practical reference. Um, war deeply affects our understanding of human experience. And as mentioned in John Romero and Steve Russell's conversation, war played a key role in the development of technologies. I think we all know that. But from Eric's and Bernie's conversation, we learned that war and embodiment played a key role in the return to play in the new games movement, war as, as being a, a place for protest. So how has this conceptual framework of war been a part of all that we do? And I have to say, for me, it's been really uh, a, a strange and interesting history. I, I decided to just have a techie aside um, with all the talk of the PDP-1 when Steve Russell was here. I actually learned to animate on a PDP-11. <laughs> And I used to have nightmares of this thing, like going down the hallway and like chasing me. Um, <laughs> and it was strange, like a big refrigerator type of thing. It was just a very large machine um, that I had to master and I had to, uh, had to code. Um, and it was, it, was, it was interesting because when I learned to do computer animation, I knew that that machine was, was from the government and it had been used to map landmines. Um, and so I, I was trying to make art on this machine that had definitely was created for another purpose and we all knew that. I think we've lost a lot of that history, which is I think a good thing in some ways. I, I think it's nice to know that we can use machines for other things, but I also want to look at people in the past who have used computers for other things as well. And you know, we often have these uh, you know, these old devices and we say, oh yes, like this is the cathode ray amusement, to, uh, amusement device, the earliest known interactive game that was patent, patented but never commercially produced in 1948. Um, and of course, we, you know, we see all these images of people, uh, you know, history of computer science is like people standing woodenly around the device. Oh, 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 you know, 
And they're always really boring. I'm like, oh my God, what is it? Why? That does not look so thrilling, you know, but it really was. <laughs> It really was, you know, and so here, you know, we have, uh, you probably are familiar with these games, you know, tennis for two, we have knots and crosses, and we also have NIM, which is this uh, medieval game that was actually programmed uh, on a computer. So, so uh, really interesting stuff happening starting in the 1950s. I want to go back a little bit, and, and my first person in this, in this kind of, in this order, talking, instead of talking about the technical details, you can ask me during lunch about the technical details, but I'm here to touch on these meaningful stories of seven people who contributed to what we think about in games and who, people who touched our play with or without technology. So the first person I'm going to talk about is Jacquard, Joseph Marie Jacquard, who um, you probably have heard of him. He invented uh, a loom. I'm going to talk about that. He's from Lyon in France. And he, as a young boy, worked in the silk mills. And he actually was this, he was called a draw boy. And he would actually go through and, and have to add colors to weaving when, um, when it was a called for in the, in the pattern. So draw boys were running back and forth, just you know, as six, seven-year-old workers, putting different colors while the looms were, were actually assembling fabric. And this doesn't seem like such a great job. Um, <laughs> You know, maybe it wasn't, you know, so maybe this is why, one of the reasons he thought he might want to reform that, you know. So he worked on this thing, you may have seen this in the history books, the Jacquard Loom, which was the first machine to use punch cards. And it, uh, it, it used punch cards to um, pick up the thread. So actually a punch card would go over, all these threads were already loaded, and it would pull thread up through the punch cards. You can probably uh, see the punch cards. The punch cards were, done, um, were linked together in a big string, and then they were made of a thin wood so they could withstand any kind of bumps or, or, or movement around. It's interesting, though, because, of course, um, this replaced his job as a draw boy, right? So he replaced his own job as a draw boy by making this machine. And, of course, there's all of these angry mobs through Lyon, the streets of Lyon, and they attacked him. They, 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 they uh, mobbed the inventor and broke up his invention. And there's a quote, the iron was sold for old iron. The wood for kindling, while I delivered, I was delivered over to universal ignominy. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, he got his butt kicked, you know. It's like, oh, God, he, you know. And then people attacked him, and there's a weird historical detail. They attacked him with shoes. Those of you who are French could probably explain this to me later. But anyway, um, so history is full of this example of labor and unrest. But why is this, you know, I can say, yes, it's the, you know, I could, the history could stop there. And often in history books, it does. But why I'm interested in, in Jacquard and this loom, and, you know, it has this place in computing. Also, he also modeled it after um, the Frenchman Jacques Vacasson. If, you ever, if you're a techie geek, Vacasson was the automaton maker who made that duck that would actually eat and then poop. The, like, anyway, really interesting guy, but uh, another story. <laughs> it's like that baby, the, the, bring the baby. Anyway, um, so why I'm interested in it is that this machine was, was, was created to make something beautiful. It was about the computer to actually be a, a pre precursor to a computer. It didn't actually compute, but it was, pro it was a programmable device that was actually made to make something beautiful. And you know, talk about the power of the punch card. The ability to, for, to change the weaves loom by simply changing cards was fascinating, and it influenced later inventors. But this idea, this is jacquard stitching. This is really hard to do if you don't have a punch card system, you know? And this, the, the, so the, it was this notion of uh, the aesthetics driving a technology, and not just this kind of an innovation, and not a war machine driving the technology innovation. So for me, as someone who's creative and someone who likes to make this stuff, it's really important for me to look to where beauty has happened with our technology and why it's meaningful to us. OK, second one, Ada Lovelace. Yay! I know. Um, so, so I got in this big conversation with this guy who, uh, who uh, you know, uh, for, well, you know, if you don't know who Ada Lovelace is, she was the illegitimate daughter of Lord Byron. Um, she was a gifted mathematician, and she assisted Charles Babbage, who was a developer of these two things. One was made in his lifetime, and one was not. Um, the, the analytic engine and the difference engine. And I got to talking with the guy who's a curator in the Science Museum in London, where the analytic engine is actually, he recreated it, and is sitting there, and you can do calculations on it, and it is a total geek fest. Ah, oh, anyway, <laughs> it is so great. And, and you know, he... So, so it's really interesting. So she comes in, and she's, she's helping him do a, a lot of uh, understanding of papers, and she's doing translations of work. And oftentimes, it's really seen as, you know, she's called the first programmer. But this is not 
a really rich tale to say, well, I was the first programmer. I made these machines work. That's not actually her contribution um, that I want to celebrate today, even though that's often talked about. Lady Lovelace comes into play, and this is her picture from 1836. She comes into play because she was the first to use the machine for something other than calculation. Babbage was part of the Royal Navy Society, Nautical Society. He was interested in keeping the British ships out safe and, like, you know, make sure the ships don't hit each other and, you know, all these calculations for navigation and maps. But that's not what she was interested in. She was the first person to say, I wonder what happens if we use this for language. And she actually was translating numerical systems into language and doing translations of texts. So this is kind of a magical moment where someone has said, here's this system. I want to use numbers to express something else. I want to make a symbolic system that can do something else. And that's what's really fascinating about her. So yes, she was indeed a coder, but she really coded a symbolic system and helped us get one step beyond in our system thinking about computing. Um, and it, it's kind of funny you, that you can actually read her work. She translated this, this uh, article by Luigi Menabreas uh, in his 1843 paper, Sketch of an Analytical Engine. And she, she wrote notes at the end, and she wrote like four times the length of the article of notes. <laughs> Apparently, this was acceptable practice. I don't know if that would be OK now. Oh, I just have something else to say while I translate to somebody else's work. But, <laughs> but what she wrote in those notes is also very interesting. She, her comments included predictions that such a computing machine might be used to compose complex music, to produce graphics, and it would be both used for practical and scientific purposes. So she's projecting the use of the computer that we're, doing, uh, that we're using it today. But she also celebrated the creative aspects of the computer, the, 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 the artistic and the aesthetic. So I, I, I think that that interest in beauty is, is, is something I, I, I uh, don't want us to, for, to forget with those two figures. I want to introduce another figure, um, Alan Turing. <laughs> so this year marked his 100th, uh, 100th birthday, though he died in 1954, we still remember him. Many of us are, are moved by his story, his personal story, in addition to his work. And uh, I'll just men touch on a few of these things, uh, his personal story as well as his work, and why I think he fits into this kind of uh, uh, innovator's uh, string that I'm pulling through this history. So in addition to the universal Turing machine, which he proposed in 1935, which meant in short terms a general purpose computer, right? Um, Alan Turing was the lead code breaker at Bletchley Park. And I was talking quite at length with Steve Russell about what was happening at Bletchley Park and which, can I call people at Bletchley Park now? And he's done a lot of work with, with them as well because, uh, because Bletchley Park was the place that the Allies were able to win the war in terms of communication. The Germans were way ahead of the Allies, technolo technologically speaking, in part due to Hollerith and punch cards used for the Nazis, which I can get into maybe in the question and answer, but and there's not a whole lot of time. It's a big um, topic. Um, but, but, but the Germans were expert code makers, and they were, they were passing secret messages about U-boats here and there, and no, no one knew where the U-boats were, and it was this big problem. And Turing was able to use computers to break that code, and he is celebrated to this day in his, in his ciphering abilities as well. But, um, but I'm interested in his ideas after the war, because instead of solving these wartime problems, but e even ciphering is about human communication. It's not about calculating bomb trajectories. It's about figuring out how people are trying to talk to each other. And that interest continued in his later, later work, in his 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. It opens with the words, I propose to consider this question, can machines think? And that, of course, kicks off what is now the, the field of artificial intelligence. But the, this, the inspiration for um, Alan Turing's test, uh, his computer intelligence test to see if a computer was intelligent enough to pass as a human, uh, was actually uh, originally made for people. Probably you, you may have heard of this. Um, it's a game called The Imitation Game. And it's where a man and a woman would sit in one room while an interviewer would sit in another room, and the interviewer asked questions that the man and woman would both answer on paper, but one of the, one of the answerers, either the man or the woman, would masquerade as the other gender. Remember, this is the 1950s. Everyone's supposed to have very codified social norms about what is a woman and what is a man at this time. And so someone is pretending, and the interviewer is supposed to then guess, based on the people's answers, who is who's the interloper, who's masquerading, right? So you can see that in this diagram, very simple, you know, is this, this person 
uh, one of these, you know, are you both masquerading as a woman or, or what? And then, of course, he extended that into a computer and said, okay, the, the Turing test, can we see which one is a computer or not? And most of us, you know, in a computer science class have played with ELISA or even built our own ELISA chatbots. Some of the people in this room have actually built things like Prom Week, which are <laughs> massive, you know, AI systems for this kind of conversation. But to me, the Turing test is a game in itself. And, since, and, and, and ever since, and with the development of the AI, with AI, it is no wonder that we continue to play games like this um, and use computers to do so. It reveals uh, itself as a game just as formative as checkers, chess, tennis, or space war. This game really asks us to be communicating and wonder about cultural constructs, about human interaction, and in that, we really have to take this into account. Uh, I don't think we can just look to the technological innovation uh, as, a, as a landmark, but we also have to look at cultural and social innovation and thinking about computers as places where we can celebrate, oh, you know, that, th this kind of inner human and inner machine um, uh, the interaction being studied in this playful game that really is quite like a game show. Um, Turing makes games human, in other words. Um, this, is, uh, this is an aside. <laughs> but he was also known to play games, and there's this really famous story where he went to, um, the, he went to go play a hand-drawn Monopoly board uh, against William Newman, the young son of uh, Max Newman, uh, the, his mathematical mentor, and he lost. Um, but he was apparently a good loser. And, and, and there's this idea that he, uh, he, uh, he was very excited about playing Monopoly, and his, his, there's this narrative, his mind was racing to understand Monopoly. And so they, they released this, um, this, uh, this, 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 uh, this, this game, uh, edition of Alan Turing, which is based on his haunts and his neighborhood. So it's, it's really kind of great. It's like a historical piece, um, custom made for his uh, school and things at King's College and stuff like that. But, um, but, and I think he's on the money of the set as well. But it, coming with this is a copy of the handmade um, uh, Monopoly board that he played. And that's kind of interesting. Now, I, wanna do I do want to touch on his personal life. Partly because it's his 100th year anniversary of his birth, and, and there was this, you know, a lot of controversy this last year on how he died. Um, he died two weeks before his 42nd birthday. Ada Lovelace died when she was 36. So this is like a young... <laughs> We're, we're burning it at both ends, people. <laughs> we, we don't have much time. Um, so, uh, so an apple, uh, an apple, a bitten apple was found at Turing's bedside. And so the lore says, it's, 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 it's really quite interesting. Um, the lore says that, uh, it, it, actually, the, the official police inquiry was that he committed suicide and, uh, with an arsenic-laced apple. And he had, and, and the, the, the logic was that he had been prosecuted for gross indecency after his homosexuality had been um, discovered or come to light during a police investigation into burglary. And the, the story gets very dark. I mean, those of us who know it, this is a uh, painful uh, story. But he, um, had been, he agreed to be treated with female hormones. Uh, it was called the chemical castration. And um, he, was, he, was, he was kind of forced to do that in a plea bargain or face prison. Um, and if he agreed to do this, he, it, it's a prisoner's dilemma in a way. Um, <laughs> he, uh, you know, was, wi anyway, it was yesterday. Um, he was widely believed to have, uh, it was widely believed to have sent him into a spiral of depression. There's also another competing um, story that he had, a, uh, that he had his own, um, that he was obsessed with Snow White. I don't know, this is another weird story, right? So who knows what the, he chose to die by reenacting the poison apple scene. I don't know where that one came from. But the, but the one that is, is quite interesting is that he also had cyanide in his house for experimentation purposes. So no one really knows what happened to Alan Turing, except it's, it's, it, that we know that his personal and professional life was destroyed by bigotry. We do know that. Um, and I think that this is a, a and it's, it's, it's no wonder that that personal history has him changing the field in such deep and profound ways. It's not a, just a technical change. It's a deep and profound way of how, how we understand computers and how we're relating to each other and what gender means. Uh, all that stuff was in this work, and I think it needs to be celebrated. And I think it's celebrated in some of the projects we even have at Indicate this year. So it makes me very <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK, so we're going to go on briefly to Christopher Tr Strachey. So, the, so um, Strachey wrote this early successful AI program 
um, and he was at Oxford, and he did a draughts, uh, a, like a checkers game, and he, he said uh, it was the first computer program to incorporate heuristics, and it was uh, one of the first computer programs. He's often left out of things. Um, it could be partly true, uh, partly due to his homosexuality as well. Um, th it's an interesting uh, history when you get into people's personal lives, how much um, people's interesting eccentric personal lives in terms of the mainstream actually lead us to ask different questions about dominant um, technologies and dominant, um, dominant norms. And so he uh, started um, asking questions about emotions and, and computers. And he, <laughs> he came up with a really interesting thing that he, he ran um, on one of Turing's uh, machines that Turing ha was working on. He, um, he wrote this built-in, he used the built-in random ge number generator of the Ferranti Mark I to generate texts that are intended to express and arouse emotions. And this is a program he wrote in 1952 called Love Letters. Uh, it would generate love letters um, based on the, <laughs> based on the, the, um, the uh, random number generator. So you see, uh, th so th this is also is really, A, they're playful. Um, it, they're kind of like a joke or, or kind of humorous. But they're also interactive text. They're poetry. I mean, a lot of us still use similar techniques when we're doing interactive uh, fiction and interactive writing. Um, and also, they're really about what it means to use a computer for. Uh, you know, an AI expert using computer for games and for poetry. You know, this is really an amazing thing. So using a computer, you know, unheard of in the cold technical histories we read, but very relevant to games. Oh, yeah, my sweet eagerness. And, and let us remind ourselves, um, you know, the kind and jolly Steve Russell, who is not here with us at, at, this, at this point in, in uh, the conference, you know, he, they, he was working on, on space war, and we often think about the technology of space war, and we think about, you know, collisions in outer space, and Steve was really excited about getting people to fly an airplane or, or fly a spaceship, and all of that is great. But he also told me that being involved in theater in college was as important to him as math and other ideas. And that seems really interesting to us. Early pioneers were as interested in the arts as they were in the sciences. Um, from theater to computing to hobbies um, to he keeps to this day, Steve expressed a joy for these places where people get in play and get to play among rules. You know, model railroading where he said, it's a game, it's a game, model railroad. Um, that, kind of, that kind of finding personal expression in physical objects and in, 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 in stuff outside of computing makes us better designers and better innovators. And so that's a point I think Steve brought to us pretty strongly. Um, so here we go. We have, uh, so I'm, I'm moving up through time. I'm in the 20th century. Thank God. Uh, I'm, I <laughs> yes, we're already in the 1960s. So in the 1960s, computers, and notice the peace symbol. Um, computers have been known. <laughs> okay. So it's good. <laughs> computers have been known for calculating bomb trajectories. You know, Leonardo was doing this kind of stuff. A lot of people go to Leonardo and his histories of bomb trajectories of Diego Ufano. Um, all, you know, computers for ciphering, decoding, but also this, this big missing piece. Computers to communicate and make art. This is something that I think we in this room have really brought into our own. Um, 1960s. Now, as Space Wars, yes, Yoko Ono is good. Uh, let me just give me a moment. As Space War was taking off and being played around the country on research computers, what else was happening in the rest of the, of the cultural landscape, right? Artists were engaging in political ideas and manifesting these ideas in their work as well. And, um, I, and, and, I, and when I say artists, I mean people who identify themselves as artists, who show their work and say, this is art. You know, it, it, I'm not trying to be, this is art, this is not art. I'm just saying people who have identified as art. And John Lennon's wife was an artist before she met John Lennon, and he was fascinated with the kind of stuff she made. You can see why. Um, um, this situation of conflict, uh, she made it several, well, many of these games, big, small, all kinds of scale. In this, in this, in this, in this work, play it by trust, a fitting title, but also uh, a, 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 an experience that could actually be experienced. It's a playable game. You can sit and play it. What does it mean to play this game? You know, what, is it, what does it bring to us? You know, we, we, know, we know what to do with this work because of what I call the ludic language. We already have... Uh, this map of chess in us, or if, even if we're not chess players, we've seen other people, we know it's a, probably a two-sided game, 
So when that language is, is brought into an artwork, we, we, know that, uh, we know what to do, but yet we don't know what to do. And that idea is really interesting, is that there's this undiscernible enemy. Does it mean, is it a statement? Does it mean that winning is impossible? Is it an aesthetic statement on games? Or does the artist mean the two to be the same? So I'm going to give you one more example. I don't want to derail us too far from my in innovator list. Seven people is a lot to focus on. But I want to do one more example, which is Ivan Falstrom's work. And um, he's not all that well known, but he did these variable paintings that were protest works. Um, they each had up to 200 movable magnetic parts. And they were, they were reconfigurable game boards that he created mostly to protest um, the CIA actions in other countries. So this one, a lot of it's about Cambodia and Vietnam actions and the military, the US military um, getting into these uh, inextricable situations in international conflicts. So I'm showing these works for two reasons. One, to call attention to and dissolve the line a little bit between art and games, to make that a little bit fuzzier than I think um, it has become. Um, and I also think, uh, I'd like to think about how games could be cast for political reasons and comment on social issues. Because that's been happening throughout the entire 20th century, and it's nice to really find examples that really speak to us. And so thinking about commenting on societal issues makes me think, oh, ho oh. <laughs> In some ways, there's a man in the front row who's, uh, you know, part of the ringmasters, ringmasters of, you know, ringmasters of play since the 60s and 70s, bringing us back to embodied forms of play. Um, yes, we have the Bernie de Coven in the audience. And yesterday, there he is. Yeah! Love! Love! Okay, so, so yesterday, if you recall, Bernie told us he wanted to give us a physical experience I mean, I mean, not each of us. I mean, maybe. <laughs> Wait. OK, a, a physical experience of community. Even then, that sounds, uh, anyway. Um, a sense of safety and that failure is as much a part of the fun experience as success. Those are things that I really took with me from, from yesterday's talk, of, of, although I took many things, as especially goodwill and just the joy of play in general. But that notion that, that, uh, that you know, we have a safe, we have, we, we're safe in play, and we can have this physical, emotional, and joyous expression of play. Um, and, and the thing that, the, the last thing I want to mention that, that Bernie really pulled out for us is he said, any play is political. And play is a political act. And that, that is kind of a radical notion for some of us who don't think of ourselves as very political. Um, or maybe we do, um, but we think that maybe the political has to be outward and say, making a statement or something like that. This is a juicy territory um, for us to be considering over the next year until the next Indie Cave. OK, so imagine the time. It's 1966. Um, Eric and, and uh, Bernie did a great job setting this scene yesterday. So I won't spend too, too much time, but playing this big earth ball, play hard, play fair, nobody get hurt. Really interesting. The descriptions in the New Games book talk about how there, you know, there's a war, there's two sides, but as soon as one side starts winning, everybody pulls over and gets on the side that's losing and starts, starts the battle backwards. So there's this kind of never-ending game. And that's something that I think is really interesting to, to see how um, the experience of play and prolonging that is actually better than actually winning or losing, right? So, so not to say that games aren't collaborative or aren't competitive, but that, that those things are fluid, and the experience has to be the thing that's maintained throughout. So this, this um, attention to that experience as a flow state to universal humanity is something really interesting. And it worked for other people, too. Even Prince Philip played a lap game. I got this off of Bernie's. <laughs> I read Bernie's blog, and I was like, oh my god, Prince Philip. <laughs> You know, because everybody's playing this lap game. I mean, I don't know. I was forced to play the lap game many times, and I was always really nervous. Like, no, I don't. And then I was like, oh, cool. This works. Wow. It's this kind of thing. And in 2007, um, the writing collective Ludica, some of whom are in this room, um, proposed a reexamination of new games and its methods as a means of, quote, constructing a shared context for meaningful play in virtual and real world spaces. So there's been a push to get these ideas into thinking about the virtual as well. And I think that that's really important, but there's an edge to such togetherness. And um, over lunch, we started talking about ideas that, <coughs> that some of the new games' games were actually pulled from military exercises. And this feels very different than that. Very different. So what does that mean? You know, we may never know what came first, this parachute or, or you know, the other parachute. But, but we, this says something else. 
And you know, we have this, this research which shows that military exercises are compelling because acting in synchrony with others, like walking in step together or singing prior to conflict, can increase cooperation. So, so a lot of military groups do this. In fact, for the talk I had, like, I found all this Chinese military people doing New Games games. And it was like, oh my god. But I, I decided not to show them all. But this link to war is not over. And it's interesting. And it, and it, and it has certain kinds of implications. But we can feel the difference. We can feel the difference between art and war, I think, in, in, this, in this image and also in our play. But I want to move a little bit also to thinking about war in the 20th century in terms of, I'm getting to the next group of people. Um, I don't know if you've ever read this. It's online in the Gutenberg, um, the Gutenberg collection. Since we're on the theme of war, beyond military training games, you know, miniature war gaming, right? Um, some of you may have a secret history in doing this. Some of you may not. I don't know. Um, but the title says a lot. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that, except I disagree. <laughs> but um, so H.G. So Rose wrote, wrote this book in 1913 um, to help us play with toy soldiers. And he made a rule book for playing with toy soldiers. Uh, and he, he, he has some really great uh, quotes. Here, I'm going to show you a quote. Um, there is, uh, uh, in all ages, a certain barbaric warfare has been waged with soldiers of tin and lead and wood, with the weapons of the wild, with the catapult, the pea shooter, and the rubber ball and such. I mean, and, and, um, and then, you know, knocking a tin murderer. You know, this idea that, that this is really a, a part of human history is to, you know, blow shit up, basically. Um, but, the, but this is not, he says this is not a new thing, no crude novelty, but a thing tested through time. So, so it's interesting that he's codifying this you know, miniature wargaming, um, and of course people uh, move forward in thinking about miniature wargaming for a long period of time. So I had to go to Gary Gygax and um, uh, 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 David Aronson, but mostly Gary Gygax. And um, <clears throat> some of you may not think that Gary Gygax has a lot to do with computing history, but I do, <laughs> especially with play history. Um, here's why. So, well, most of you know Dungeons and Dragons. If you don't know Dungeons and Dragons, um, and you think it's before your time or something like that, you're influenced by it anyway. There's no such thing as an orc. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody made it up. <laughs> Somebody made it, you know, th these guys. So, so, um, so, so this gaming, you know, uh, Gary, I'm also from Wisconsin originally. It comes out in Wisconsin. And Gary Gygax was from Wisconsin. I went to a Gen Con when I was a very young person, and I, I still go to Gen Con now, this big, it was up to 40,000 people, gamers, mostly role-playing gamers. It's held every year in Indianapolis. And my lab, Tilt Factor, has a, has a booth there. But interesting, Dungeons and Dragons, okay, this, ground, this groundbreaking role-playing game. Um, it was a communal game. One player assigned the dungeon master and, you know, everyone else. We have die rolls. I mean, some of you probably know this. But I think what, we're, what we forget is it was also positioned as a family game, even though Gary Gygax had a history of miniature tabletop uh, war games. Um, I do want you to see this nugget. Hey. Your dungeon master has placed you in a dreadfully precarious position. You're playing the most phenomenal game ever created. Your skin grows cold from your first glimpse of the enormous beast. It's a product of your imagination. Survival depends on a quick, decisive move. Your choices are limited. Stand and fight, or run. Use your lightning bolt. Victory is yours. Win the treasure. TSR Hobbies. Dungeons and Dragons games. Products of your imagination. family game. This game was positioned as a family game, and it was also an interesting moment where the experience of play went from the computer or the material the, uh, to the ephemeral in the performative. So it's, uh, it's another kind of history where we have play coming out into a different space and into fantasy space. This is very interesting for me, and it's something that's it's, it's pretty important to think about when we... Um, when we're trying to make this history, you know, when uh, he, uh, Gary Gygax collaborated with uh, store owner Jeff Perrin, and he wrote the, uh, I got into model railroads a little bit, and miniature war games. This is all linked in my head. Um, but, but Chainmail was a, was a, mini, was a well, miniature war gaming uh, uh, manual that Gary Gygax and Jeff Perrin wrote, and in the back they made uh, a kind of ad addition that had rules for, for, you know, like alternate rules for play, like possible games that could be 
um, played with miniature wargaming. And this is really interesting because, of course, you know, uh, again, Gary Gygax is a high school dropout. He began playing Civil War-based board games uh, called Gettysburg in high school and dropped out of high school. And his day job was as an insurance salesman until TSR took off. So this is an indie gamer extraordinaire um, out of his living room, in, literally <laughs> continuing on in his living room until his very last days. Um, playing. Um, but Dungeons and Dragons to me isn't a straightforward game like Monopoly or Clue, right? It's, it's an interesting thing, but it, it's, it's kind of like an operating system. It's kind of like a, 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 pl a framework where people build their own scenarios and anyone, there's this kind of promise in the rhetoric from Gygax that anyone can be a game designer. And, and that is part of what we think, I think, that is true, right? We think that we can be game designers and we take that and we say, yes, you know, we're going to pursue this with passion and with integrity. And that is something that G Gygax did as well. And here's something that he said. There's a call to adventure. It's something in the inner psyche of humanity. And he was trying to make games to facilitate that. And I think we all are too. So what do Call of Duty and the parachute game have in common? I think I've shown you some of those links. There have been these strands of, 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 of exploration of game history at Indicate this year. The history of computer games and their technological development, and including the link to wargaming, but then the history of human play, psychological, fantastical, whimsical, kooky, strange, dangerous. Um, and, and unearthing these personal contributions to gaming history, I'm ho I hope that, that I was able to, to, to show how these things can come together, and I think they come together in the work that we do. Um, and I don't think that these diverse voices have been celebrated and these various strands celebrated enough to show that this history is an indie history and we are indie, hear us roar. Yeah! <laughs> so, really quickly, I think I, I'm, I'm probably, I don't have any sense of time. Okay, good, nice. So, I have just a, a few things I want to show. One is one I, uh, just an aside I saw at the, the Tate Modern a uh, couple, like last month. And then some stuff that uh, is uh, here. So I want to just give a little bit of a recap. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen this work. Tino Segal's uh, in the Turbine Hall of the Tate Modern in London. There's a, a work called These Associations. And it's this interesting thing. It goes on all day, every day of the Tate Modern. It's happening in the big Turbine Hall. It's this massive space. And these, uh, these are little algorithms that uh, a crowd of dancers and performers have. And they're um, doing this kind of public play that's dynamic, spontaneous, and algorithmic. And it changes throughout the course of the day. Different kind of uh, activities will start to happen. Also, passersby come up. Um, there are short, simple rule sets cause change. And, 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 and one of the rules is that every one of the players has to periodically go to a passersby and confess something. Confess something personal. And then the passersby sometimes is compelled to join that person, like what a strange thing I've just heard from this person. So it's, a, it's this very interesting relational project that sits on a fuzzy line between art, action, and game that I think is really interesting. And it's, 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 it, it's, it's, a, it's a work that, um, that someone called, you know, this is not his masterpiece because it belongs to all of us. I don't know if I, I want to go to masterpiece level critiquing, but I like this idea that this is a work that is spontaneous, joinable, and um, teachable but not in a traditional game space. And that makes me very excited about thinking about where, where those lines between art and game are. Um, uh, a, a, few more, um, a few more moments where there's confusion and interesting tension between art and game. You know, Johann Sebastian Jaus, Anne-Marie Anne -Marie Schleiner's out game performances where she was doing uh, protests in America's army and projecting them on the, uh, on the walls of, uh, on, the, on the outside exterior walls of New York City while um, the Republican National Convention was going on during our last election year. It's, I hope that similar kinds, I haven't seen too many things this year, which maybe it's just despair and I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, each of these work, each of these artists ha are, are playing with that place between the digital and the analog, between performance and real life and um, technology. And I think more and more we'll see these kinds of things. I think that that was really, for me, quite instrumentally done in this somewhat old, if you want to call it old piece from 1999 called Brain Ball, which was uh, a game where you had to relax to win. Um, and you had to, you had to relax so much that the, the table would start to tip towards the person who was less relaxed. And then the ball would roll. And if the ball rolled off the table, you would lose. So you had to, you know, this is, this is not good. This is, a, I'm not good at this game. I, I just, I'm just like, no, 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 you know, 
this, but that's funny. And I, I <laughs> and that's the, you know, I, I really like these kinds of games, which, which, which play with our, with all kinds of expectations. Or games like, um, like a Cory Archangel's game, which is not a game at all. It's an artwork. Where is Mario? It's gone. There's nothing left. He's actually modded Super Mario Clouds to have nothing left. This is kind of, you know, no risks, no player actions, no rewards, no bonuses or deaths. But because we have that ludic language, we know that that's happening. And that this work is for us, you know. It's not. It's not just a pretty thing. It's really to, uh, for having us reflect on what a game is and what a game could be. And then I have some games from here, from our own uh, festival. Find me a good one. Woo! It's a real puzzle platformer that explores responsibility felt by players towards non-fictional characters. Sounds a little Turingy, doesn't it? Yes, 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 yes. Or interference. Yay! So. That you know, the, this 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 groups of people coming together, trying to you know, trying to figure out what the other players do, you know, stealing from other players and then interfering, but also then being part of some large beautiful thing. It's just a construction of a beautiful thing. Whether you want to build a beautiful thing or not, you are a part of it, and that could be a very profound thing. Just the the scale of the work, I think, is is quite moving, and it really does affect the things. Armada D6. The thing that I like most about this one actually is the backstory, which is that it could be, there's this, Eric says on his website, there's, a, there's this possible tie to religious ritual. This gets me every time. Just say your, your game is tied to religious ritual, I'm like, oh my god, I have to study this game. But, but, it, but it's true because when I was researching um, the book Critical Play, I ran into all this stuff about the origins of Go, and there, it, it, you know, it has these misty origins. We don't really know much about it, but in fact, Go is considered to be a way of communicating with the gods. And when I, when I, um, when I worked at, uh, I, I did a game for the Discovery Channel, and I did this thing on Egyptian history, and we made a, a virtual Senate game. And it was, uh, like, uh, it was like cutting edge, because it had like, two-player capability in a, in a, in a non-server-based technology. And uh, we had the pharaoh, you could play against the pharaoh, and this was not a joke. I actually had this Egyptologist I worked with, and, and it was believed that you could play for your soul um, in Egyptian culture, at least at certain times. That you, you know, this is why King Tut has 30 Senate boards in his tomb, because he had to play a lot. He had a lot of gold. He was like really working it out with Ra. So, um, so, this, is, so this is interesting to me, that, that, that our games have been tied historically, really in the ancient time, to, to moving spiritual quests. And that is something that we carry in us in, when we make games. And I think that this game if, it, you know, could have that link, and that makes it um, even beyond a good game to be probably a little magical. Um, <laughs> maybe. Um, and then you know, social making social relationships playable. Prom week. Yay. So prom week. Make, you know, this is like, you know, I, I want Alan Turing to rise from the dead just to play prom week. I really want to know what he has to say. I want to know. I want to know what he has to say. Um, and then um, reality ends here. Yay! Several of you. You know, a pervasive game, you know, designed to, 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 to mold the mind of freshman students. I can think of nothing better to do. Um, no, uh, but, I, but I think there's this, this sense of, you know, all the, like, secrecy and coding and, uh, you know, the history I gave today, I think, shows us that this kind of play is really tied in to some of the things that we've learned um, in a good way from the creative history that I've mentioned today. Um, and using creative prompts to then, anyone can be a game designer, anyone can start to make media and really participate in the creation and unfolding of their own games, something really important to me. So I, I have a quote I want to end with, um, and a call. Um, this is a quote from Marshall McLuhan. And our contemporary uh, challenges are rooted in an awareness of impingements on everyday rights, global economic crises, I could, I'm going to go on, <laughs> Automa <laughs> automated and ill-defined global conflicts, fracking, overpopulated areas, overpolluted things. We have a lot of difficult things on our planet right now in which individual action seems just inconsequential. Yet it is the job of the player to have faith in the transformative power of play. And that transformative power of play brings us to places like Indicades, to play together, to experience puzzle, awe, wonderment at the imagination of the designers and artists in this room. It is a transformative promise of play that brings us together to invent, innovate, and try something new. 
Brought together to play, our impact can be greater than each of us as individuals. I'm really happy to be part of this community here, and I want to celebrate this year's Indicade and look forward to next. Thank you.